and we're going live now. So one second. Thank you for those who are just joining us. This is Imuna Yisrael. This is an extension of Take Time to Heal. It's called the Lev Project or Lift Every Voice. Where will we be? Sorry, we will be reading collectively. It's a community conversation. I love community conversations. Um, so it's a community yeah. conversation, and we'll be reading the narratives. At this point, we're gonna the first narrative that we'll be reading is um uh 50 years in chains by charles ball and it's a story of we're going to read two stories but we're going to go a little bit at a time with each session uh this is the first session we're going to read two chapters today after which we'll be discussing and again it will be live streaming both teleconference as well as as you see me here on the internet um where, where are you online i am putting the, the link right now up on on um on my page and so we're live on YouTube at the channel in Muna Yisrael. And so um, we can we can have you read either. We have those on a teleconference. You can say greetings and shalom to the viewers if you would like at this point. Hello. Michelle, are reading chapter one? Yes, Miss Michelle Gill. She was one of our first volunteers. We thank her so much. And she has volunteered to read chapter one. So I want to say greetings to Ima Dorothy. It's good to see you on. It's always a pleasure to see you. Um, and we're just going to wait a little bit for a few more people to join us and for me to update uh, this page right now. And um, from there, let me see if I can find a jazzy little tune for us to jazz to until we get started. So one moment, please. I'm trying to coordinate what they call it simulcast. I'm trying to simulcast, making it as best it can for everyone who's involved. Oh, see, I was asking for some music. Oh, wait, I was like, ooh, somebody singing for me? I thought there was somebody on the line singing for me. <laughs> okay, hold on one time. Unless y'all want me to sing. All right. I haven't sung in a long time. But I think I'll sing. I'll sing your song. Would you like you guys to sing your song? Oh, let me hear you sing. Hallelujah, you my Dorothy. <laughs> All right, I'll sing a song. I haven't sung this one in a while. Um, you know, sometimes when we're going through troubles in a rough spot in life, as we are about to read about our four parents, answers, sisters, those who were throughout the Americas and the difficult time that they endured here. Um, they sung a lot of songs to to get them through. So this is a song that dropped in my spirit um, with that same tone. And I wanted to just open up by saying all praises to the Holy One of creation, giving thanks and praise for this day, his mercy and blessings upon our soul. And may these readings and this work that we're going forth to do collectively provide healing for our minds, our hearts and souls in this time and this day and age. Um, so thanks once again for joining us. Again, my name is Amuni Yisrael, and hallelujah. I'll sing a song, um, Help Is Coming is the name of the song. It goes, although we've traveled on life's road, and we bear this heavy load, just hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, help is coming, hold on, help is coming, hold on, help is coming, see help. Is on the way. Although we travel on life's road and we bear this heavy load, just hold on, hold on, hold on. Hallelujah, hold on. I know our four parents may have been singing, hold on, help is coming. Hallelujah, I told her for those who have joined us. That song made me want to start, you know, um, definitely 
uh, tear up at this time. But also one more thing before we go in, I have to sing one that I've known for. And I saw in a review that um, I actually finished it and, and released it this time last year, the 1st of January. And so I want to give thanks for that. Um, the Zakar Song Project, for those who are familiar, for those who are not familiar, it's out of the book of Second Chronicles. And it is for our four parents who we're about to read about right now, who may not have known what was the problem, who may not known the transgressions, who may not have known why we were out of universal alignment, who may have not known what this was all about. Um, May the Most High remember us in this time. May he forgive us and, and our trespasses and return us back onto the places that he promised onto our forefathers. And so this is the Zakar Song Project. I'm kind of impromptu, but it, 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 the Spirit is leading me to do it, so I'm going to do it, and then we're going to get started uh, once again. So uh, thanks, everybody, for sticking with us. So the Zakar Song goes like this. We kneel in these lands of captivity we kneel and we pray for your mercy we've sinned and i've done perversely transgressed we've transgressed against thee Abba, forgive your children and remember the words that you said. Abba, we are your children. Please remember the name. Israel, Israel, trust in the Most High with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind in these lands of your enemies. On bending knees, we pray. Abba, forgive your children and remember the words that you said. Abba, we are your children, so please remember the name Israel, Israel. Zakar, 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 oh yeah. Zakar, Zakar, Baba Kusha. Zakar, 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 oh yeah. Zakar, Zakar, Babakwasha, Zakar. Hallelujah. May the Most High remember us in yeah. this time and remember the words that He has left on record. Um, at this point, we are going to start reading from five, 50 years. I don't know why I keep saying that. I'm sorry. 50 years in chains. Um, if you don't have the link, the link is, I'm going to repost the link here and we can follow along. So Miss Michelle Gill, I want to thank you for joining us. You are our first volunteer. Um, and that is a beautiful, wonderful thing. So I pray you're doing well this evening or this morning, afternoon wherever you are, you could definitely introduce yourself and let us know, is it morning, evening, or afternoon in your location? Hi, um, my name is Michelle Gill. I'm honored to participate. Um, it is afternoon. I am actually um, vacationing, I guess, a little bit in Canada. Oh, and okay. I'm from the United States. 
All right. All right. So I hope you're having a good time in Canada. And um, thank you so much for taking some time from your vacation to join us. And we look forward to this first portion of this book. So as I look for this portion, I know I sent it to you. And so, oh, I have, I know where it is. So we can go ahead and get started in two seconds as I get it for myself to pull this thing up again on the computer. Okay, here we go. And so if you're ready, and they actually scanned the book in. Whoever um, uploaded this specific copy, you can actually see um, the book as it was written. So I thought like, that's an interesting thing. But I'm going to hand it over to Miss Michelle Gill. Here it is. And now the mic is yours. Okay. We are reading from 50 Years in Chain, The Life of an American Play, Chapter 1, Separated from My Mother. My story is true, and I shall tell it in a simple stop. It will be merely a recital of my life as a slave in the southern states of the Union, a description of Negro slavery in the model republic. My grandfather was brought from Africa and sold as a slave in Calvert County, in Maryland. I never understood the name of the ship in which he was in part imported, nor the name of the planter who brought him on his arrival. But at the time I knew him, he was a slave in a family called Maw who resided near Leonardtown. My father was a slave in a family named Haughty, living near the same place. My mother was a slave of a tobacco planter who died when I was about four years old. My mother had several children, and they were sold upon master's death to separate purchasers. She was sold, my father told me, to a Georgia trader. I, of all her children, was the only one left in Maryland. When sold, I was naked, never having had on clothes in my life. But my new master gave me a child's frock belonging to one of his own children. After he had purchased me, he dressed me in this garment, took me before him on his horse, and started home. But my poor mother, when she saw me leaving her for the first for the last time, ran after me, took me down from the horse, clapped me in her arms and wept loudly and bitterly over me. Mm. My master seemed to pity her and endeavored to soothe her distress by telling her that he would be a good master to me and that I should not want anything. She then, still holding me in her arms, walked along the road beside the horse as he moved slowly and earnestly and imploring, he sought my master to buy her and the rest of her children and not permit them to carry me away, I mean, to be carried away by the Negro buyers. But while thus entreating him to save her and her family, the slave driver who had first bought her came running in pursuit of her while a rawhide, with a rawhide in his hand. When he overtook us, he told her he was her master now and ordered her to give that little Negro to its owner and come back with him. My mother then turned to him and cried, Oh, master, do not take my child. Without making any reply, he gave her two or three heavy blows mm. on the shoulder with his rawhide, snatched me from her arms, handed me to my master, and seizing her by one arm, dragged her back towards the place of sale. My master then quickened the pace of his horse, and he, as we advanced, the cries of my poor parent became more and more indistinct. At length, they died away in the distance, and I never again heard the voice of my poor mother. Young as I was, the horrors of the day sank deeply in my heart, and even at, that, even at this time, though a half a century has elapsed, the terrors of the scene return with painful vividness upon my memory. Frightened at the sight of the cruelties inflicted upon my poor mother, I forgot my own sorrows at parting from her and clung to my new master. And as an angel and a savior, when compared with the hardened fiend into whose power she had fallen, she had been a kind and a good mother to me, had warmed me in her bosom in the night, in the cold nights of winter, and had often divided the scanty pittance of food allowed her by her mistress, between my brothers and sisters and me, and gone supperless to bed herself. Whatever 
individual she could obtain. Behold the coarse food, salt fish, and cornbread allowed to save slaves of the Pacton and Potomac rivers she carefully distributed among her children and treated us with all the tenderness which her own miserable condition would permit. I have no doubt that she was chained and driven to Carolina and toiled out the residue of a forlorn and famished existence in the rice swamp or indigo fields of the south. My father never recovered from the effects of the shock, which a sudden and overwhelming ruin of his family gave him. He had formerly been a gay, sober temper, and when he came to see us on Saturday night, he always brought us some little present, such as meals of a poor slave would allow, apples, melons, sweet potatoes, or, if he could procure nothing else, a little parched corn, which tasted better in our cabin because he had brought it. He spent the greater part of the time which his master permitted him to pass with us in relating such stories as he had learned from his companions or in singing the rude song common among slaves of Maryland and Virginia. After this time, I had never heard him laugh heartily or sing a song. He became gloomy and morse in his temper to all but me and spent nearly all his leisure time with my grandfather, who claimed kindred, kindred with some royal family in Africa and had been a great warrior in his native country. The master of my father was a hard, generous man, and so exceedingly avaricious that he scarcely allowed himself to common conveniences of life. A stranger to sensibility, he was incapable of tracing the change in the temper and deportment of my father, so it's true call, but attributed it to the sullen discontent with his conditions as a slave and a desire to abandon his service and seek his liberty by escaping some of, some of the free state. To prevent this perpetu perpetration of this suspected crime of running away from slavery, the old man saw resolved to sell my father to a southern slave dealer and accordingly applied to one of those men who was at the time in Calvert to become the purchaser. The price was agreed, agreed on, but as my father was a very strong, active, and resolute man, it was deemed unsafe for the Georgian to attempt to seize him, even with an aid of others in the daytime when he was at work, as it is known he carried upon his person a large knife. It was therefore determined to secure him by stratagem for this purpose, a farmer in the neighborhood who was made privy to the plan alleged that he had lost a pig, which must have been stolen by someone, and that he suspected my father to be the thief. A constable was employed to arrest him, but as he was afraid to undertake the business alone, he called on his way at the house of the master of my grandfather to procure assistance from the overseer of the plantation. When he arrived at the house, the overseer was at the barn, and thither he prepared to make his application. At the end of the barn was the coach house, and as the day was cool, to avoid the wind, which was high, the two walked to the side of the coach house to talk over the matter, to settle their plans of operation. It was, hap it was so happened that my grandfather, whose business was to keep the coach in good condition, was at work at this time, rubbing the plated handles of the door and brightening the other metallic parts of the vehicle. Hearing the voice of the overseer was out, he suspended his work and listened attentively, became a party to their counsel. They agreed that they would delay the execution of their project until the next day, as it was then late. They supposed that they would have no difficulty in apprehending their intended victim as knowing himself innocent of the death, he would readily consent to go with the constable to justice of the peace to have the charge examined. That night, however, about midnight, my grandfather silently repaired the cabin of my father, a, distinct, a distant 
of about three miles, arose, aroused him from his sleep, made him acquainted with the extent of his danger, gave him a bottle of cider and a small bag of parched corn, and then enjoined him to fly from the destination which awaited him. In the morning, the Georgian could not find his newly purchased slave, who was never seen or heard of in Maryland from that day. Wow. After the flight of my father, my grandfather was the only person left in Maryland with whom I could claim kindred. He was an old man, nearly 80 years old, he said, and he manifested at the fondness of me, all of the fondness of me that I could expect from one so old. He was feeble, and his master required but little work from him. He always expressed contempt for his fellow slaves. When, for when young, he was an African of rank in the his native land. He had a small cabin of his own with half an acre of ground attached to it, which he cultivated of his own account and from which he drew a large share of his sustenance. He had singular religious notions, never going to meeting or caring for the preachers he could, if he would, occasionally hear. He retained his native traditions respecting the deity and hereafter. It is not strange that he believed the religion of his oppressors to be an invention of designing men. For the text often is quoted of his theory was servant, obey, or be obedient to your master. The name of the man who purchased me at the vit venue became my master was John Cox, and he was generally called Jack Cox. He was a man of kindly feelings towards his family and treated his slave, for whom he had several besides me, with humanity. He permitted my grandfather to visit me as often as he pleased, and allowed him sometimes to carry me to his own cabin, which stood in a lonely place, at the head of a deep hollow, almost surrounded by a thicket of cedar trees, which had grown up in a worn-out, abandoned tobacco field. My master gave me better clothes than the little slave, of my age generally received in color and often told me that he intended to make me his waiter and if I had behaved well, I should become his overseer in time. These stations of waiter and overseer appeared to be the highest point of honor and greatness in the whole world and had not circumstances frustrated my master's plan as well as my own view, I should probably have been living at this time in a cabin on the corner of some tobacco plantation. Fortunate, fortune had decreed otherwise. When I was about 12 years old, my master Jack Cox died of a disease which had long confined him to the house. I was sorry for the death of my master, who had always been kind to me, and I soon discovered that I had good cause to regret his departure from this world. He had several children at the time of his death who were all were of all young, the oldest being of my age. The father of my late master, who was still living, became administrator of his estate and took possession of his property and among the rest of myself. This old gentleman treated me with the greatest severity and compelled me to work very hard on his plantation for several years until I supposed I must have been near or quite 20 years of age. As I was always very obedient and ready to execute his order, I did not receive much whipping, but suffered greatly from want of sufficient and proper food. My master allowed his slaves to pick corn each per week throughout the year, and this would, excuse me, this had to grind into meal in a hand mill for ourselves. We had a tolerable supply of meat for a short time, about the month of December, when he killed his hog. After that season, we had meat once a week, and this bacon became scarce, which very often happened, in which cause we had no meat at all. However, as we fortunately lived near both the Patton River and the Chesapeake Bay, we had abundance of fish in the spring. And as long as the fishing season continued, after that period, each slave received, in addition to his allowance of corn, one thought hearing each day, every day. My master gave me one pair of shoes, one pair of stockings, one hat, one jacket of coarse clothes, two coarse shirts, and two pairs of trousers yearly. 
He allowed me no other clothes. In the winter time, I often suffered very much from the cold, as I had to drive them, excuse me, drive the team of oxen, which hauled the tobacco to market, and frequently did not get home until late at night. The distance being considerable, and my cattle traveled very slow. One Saturday evening, when I came from the cornfield, my master told me that he had hired me out for a year at the city of Washington, and that I would have to live at the Navy Yard. On the New Year's Day following, which happened about two weeks afterward, my master set forth for Washington on horseback and ordered me to accompany him on foot. It was night when we arrived at the Navy Yard, and everything appeared very strange to me. I was told by a gentleman who had epilepsy on his shoulders that I must go board a large ship which lay in the river. He at the same time told a boy to show me the way. The ship proved to be frigate and I was told that I had been brought there to cook for the people belonging to her. In the course of a few days, the duties of my station became quite familiar to me and in the enjoyment of the profusion of the excellent provisions, I felt very happy. I strove by all means to please the officers and gentlemen who came on board, and in this, I soon found my account. One gave me a half-worn coat, another an old shirt, and a third a cast-off waistcoat and pantaloons. Some presented me with some small sums of money, and in this way, I soon found myself well-clothed and with more than a dollar in my pocket. My duties, though constant, were not burdensome. I was permitted to spend Sunday afternoon in my own way. I generally went up in the city to see the new and splendid building. I often walked as far as Georgetown and made, nudie, and made <laughs> many new acquaintances among the slaves and frequently saw large numbers of people of my color chained together in their train and driven off towards the south. At that time, the slave trade was not regarded with so much indignation and disgust as it is now. It was a rare thing to hear of a person of color running away and escaping altogether his master. My father being the only one within my knowledge who had, before this time, obtained the liberty in this manner in Colbert County. And as before stated, I never heard what became of him after his flight. I remained on board the frigate and about the Navy Yard two years and was quite satisfied with my lot until about three months before the expiration of this period when it so happened that a schooner loaded with iron and other materials for the use of the yard arrived from Philadelphia. She came and lay close by the frigate to discharge her cargo, and amongst her crew, I observed a black man with whom, in the course of a day or two, I became acquainted. He told me he was free and lived in Philadelphia, where he kept a house of entertainment for sailors, which he said was attended to in his absence by his wife. His description of Philadelphia and of the liberty enjoyed there by the black people so charmed my imagination that I determined to devise some plan of escaping from the frigate and making my way to the north. I communicated my designs to my new friend who promised to give me his aid. He agreed that the night before the schooner should sail, I was to be concealed in the hold amongst a parcel of loose tobacco, which he said the captain had undertaken to carry to Philadelphia. The selling of the schooner was delayed longer than we expected. And finally, he, excuse me, her captain purchased a cargo of flour in Georgetown and sailed for the West Indies. One second, oh, sis. Uh, sis, now. one second. I just want to say for those who have just joined us, we are at this time reading 50 Years in Chains, and we're listening to the first chapter being read by Michelle Gill, doing so wonderfully, I might add. So if you want to follow along, if you want to just listen along, or if you desire to read, 
um, in the coming times, because we're going to go through the whole book, just uh, be sure to let me know and we can definitely do that. So for those who are just joining us, I just wanted to say, because we had a few people who just joined us, that we're on page 20 of 50 Years in Chains. We're almost finished the first chapter. It is interesting. And after we finish, we'll have a discussion and then go on to chapter two. I'm sorry about that, sis. You, you was at West Indies. You can go ahead and pick it up. While I was anxiously awaiting some of the opportunity of making my way to Philadelphia, the idea of crossing the country to the western part of Pennsylvania never entered my mind. New Year's Day came and it went. And with it came my old master from Calvert, accompanied by a gentleman named Gibson, to whom he said he had sold me and to whom he delivered me over in the Navy Yard. We all three sat out the same evening for Culver and reached the residence of my new master the next day. Here, I was informed that I had become the subject of a loss. My new master claimed me under his purchase from old Mr. Cox, and another gentleman of the neighborhood named Levin Ballard had bought me of the children of my former master, Jack Cox. This suit continued in the course of Culvert more than two years, but was finally decided to favor him who had bought me of the children. I went home with my master, Mr. Gibson, who was a farmer, and with whom I lived three years. Soon after I came to live with Mr. Gibson, I married a girl of color named Judah, the slave of a gentleman by the name of Simi, who resides in the same neighborhood. I was at the house of Mr. Simi um, every week and became as well acquainted with him and his family as I was with my master. Mr. Simmons also married a wife about the time I did. The lady whom he married lived near Philadelphia. And when she first came to Maryland, she refused to be served by a black chambermaid, but employed a white girl, the daughter of a poor man who lived near. The lady was reported to be very wealthy and brought a large trunk full of plate and other valuable articles. This trunk was so heavy that I could scarcely carry it, and it impressed my mind with the idea of great riches in the owner at the time. At some time, Miss Simi dismissed her white chambermaid and placed my wife in a situation which I regarded as a fortunate circumstance, as it ensured her good food and at least one good, good suit of clothes. The Simi's family was one of the most ancient in Maryland and had a long time, had been a long time resident in Culver County. The grounds had been laid out and all the improvements reject, rejected about the family abode in the style of much magnificence, according to the customs of the old aristocracy of Maryland and Virginia. A pendant of the domicile and at no distance from the house was a family vault Bought, built of bricks in which the poles of occupants of the estate who had lived there for many previous generations. This vault had not been opened or entered for 15 years previous to the time of which I speak, but it so happened that at this period a young man, a, distinct, a distant relative of the family, died, having requested of his deathbed that he might be buried in his family's rest. When I came on Saturday evening to see my wife and child, Mr. Simmons desired me, as I was older than any of the other black men, to take an iron pick and go and open the vault, which I accordingly did, by cutting away the mortar and removing a few bricks from one side of the building. But I could not remove more than three or four bricks before I was obliged by the horde um, Luvia? Yeah, that word is. Luvia? Yeah, that's a wild. Fluvia, yes, that's what it looks like. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a wild <laughs> word right there. Issue. Yeah. <laughs> was issued, issued at the aperture to retire. It was the most deadly and sickening sense that I had ever known. And I could not return to complete the work until after the sun had risen the next day. And I pulled down so much of one side of the wall, one of the side walls, so I, 
to permit persons to walk in upright. I then went in alone and examined the house of the dead, and surely no picture could be more strongly and vividly depict the emptiness of all the earthly vanity and the nothingness of human pride. Mm. Um, dispersed over the floor lay the fragments of more than 20 human skeletons. Even in the place where it had been deposited by the idle tenderness of surviving friends, in some cases, nothing remained but the hair, but the hair and the larger bones, while the several, the form of the coffin was yet visible with all the bones resting in their proper places. One coffin, the sides of which were yet standing, the lid only having decayed and partly fallen in, so as the disclosed and the content of this narrow cell presented a peculiar, a peculiar, peculiar, I can't get it out. Yeah, peculiar. Peculiar. Yeah, pe peculiar <laughs> is a wild word too, peculiar. <laughs> yeah. Upon the center of the lid was a large silver plate and the head and foot were adorned with silver stars. The nails which had united the parts of the coffin had also silver heads. Within lay the skeletons of the mother and her child and her infant child, and slumbers only to be broken by the peal of the last trumpet. The bones of the infant lay upon the breast of the mother, where the hands of affection had shrouded them. The ribs of the parent had fallen down and it rested on the backbone. Many gold rings were about the bones of the finger. Brilliant earrings lay beneath where the ears had been, and the glittering gold chain encircled the ghostly and haggard vertebrae of one beautiful neck. The shroud and the flesh had disappeared, but the hair of the mother appeared strong and fresh. Even the silken locks of the infant were still preserved. Behold the end of the youth and beauty, and all that is lovely in life. The coffin was so much decayed that it could not be removed. A thick and dismal vapor hung embodied on the roof and walls of the. Is that Charno? Yeah, it looks like Charno. Charno mm -hmm. House, in appearance somewhat like a mass of dark cobweb, but which was the impal palpable to touch to the touch and when stirred by the hand vanished away on the second day we deposited with his kindred the corpse of the young man and at night I, re I again carefully closed up the breach which I had made in the walls of this dwelling place of the dead thank you for that that was chapter one for those who have just joined us and for those who have been with us 50 years in change the life of an American slave um, thank you, Ms. Michelle Gill, for reading the first chapter. I know that one was a bit lengthy, but we were. it's a very interesting story as it's beginning to develop. If anyone has any uh, comments so far, and this really is like comments on what it made you feel to hear um, someone, you know, sometimes, like I was saying, for me, it's important because oftentimes, you know, slavery is just kind of broad brushed. Uh, but this person is sharing um, you know, the intimate experience of what they experienced. So again, how did it make you feel to um, hear this narrative being told? Um, what are some of the things that came to mind? If anything, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of like there in my mind, uh, but I'll let someone go if someone likes to speak at this point. If you're on the line, just you can just speak because it's, it's broadcasting live. And if you're online, just go ahead and text us and then, um, we can definitely have the conversation. So anyone on the line would like to speak about what you felt so far in listening to the story? Everyone's quiet. Is any, are we there? Maybe they have their phones on mute. Well, I would say for me, um, because I'm a mother, you know, and a wife, the, the beginning of the story, the very first chapter, the very first beginning separated from my mother is what, and like he said later on from 50 years later, that that scene resonates with him. 
and still is with him as he felt sorrier for his mother than he did for his unknown fate to come. Um, you know, that, that, that just listening to that just as the beginning of what his childhood looked like. Um, yeah. And just imagining it, it, it it's, and, and this is a narrative that would have been told over and over. This is the experiences of hundreds and thousands of people that this was their experience being torn away from uh, their mothers and their fathers having to run away. In this case, he's torn away from his father, mother, and his father has to run away. Um, you know, but I'll let someone speak at this point. If not, then I'll go on to reading chapter two. But we would love to hear you. This is lift every voice, so please don't be uh, shy to lift your voice. And if the and if this one that I have is a little bit fady, I have another one as well that we can read from because I know someone was telling me the words are a little bit fady on this one. I have another one that I can post as well if you would like to read. This is uh, another. I'd like to see them. Okay, you can go ahead. Yes, indeed. Thank you. This is in the background. My daughter is here. Um, it was profound to me how, you know, it was interpreted that both, both the blessing and the curse came from their master as to, you know, whether they ended up on, a, you know, who they ended up owning them. And that was extreme that they had to look to their master to whether they would be blessed or, you know, most often cursed. Yes. That was a good observation because I saw that too. I saw I saw that too. Mm -hmm. I, I saw that comparison in the mind that you, you you know, like you said, okay, this one he was blessed, but he felt sorry for his mother because she had a wretched master and he was one that um had one who would take care of him. I also saw that um go ahead, I'll let you finish. I finish. Okay. Yeah, so um That's an interesting observation also. That's an interesting observation also. I, I noticed his temperament, I guess in the narrative, like you said, thus far, his temperament was one where it's kind of Yosef-like. It's kind of like Joseph kind of of a temperament where he, he, he knows that this is his lot, but he's not indignant about it just yet. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I noticed that as well because um, just by the way in which he's speaking, it's almost like surreal like are you serious <laughs> you know but <laughs> right yeah it, it's um yeah but okay so i think we have one question the book is free if you have amazon prime account okay uh someone asked the question someone was asking a question so if you have a question definitely go ahead and put it in the chat room or the the message or on my facebook and then i'll ask the question and that's no problem or if you have a Yeah. And read chapter two because now I'm interested to see what happens now with his whole on the ship thing. Yeah. So we're going to start at chapter two. Okay, hold on. Before we do that, I think we have a question. I'm listening. I will be in and out. My kids are requesting my attention. No problem. That's no problem. We're here. It's on rewind. So definitely we're going to go through the whole book incrementally. Our next reading will be most high willing. Uh, Yom was shown the first day of the week, uh, Sunday for those who don't know. And um, so we'll be back reading again, picking up at chapter three. 
Um, and so let me go ahead here. It's chapter two. I'll go ahead and read chapter two. Some short time after my wife became chambermaid to her mistress, it was my misfortune to change masters once again. Sorry, once more. Levine, Levine Ballard, who, as before stated, had purchased me of the children of my former master, Jack Cox, was successful in his lawsuit with Mr. Gibson, the object of which was to determine the right of property in me. And one day, whilst I was at work in the field, Mr. Ballard came and told me I was his property, asking me at the same time if I was willing to go with him. I told him I was not willing to go, but that if I belonged to him, I knew I must. We then went to the house, and Mr. Gibson not being at home, Miss Gibson told me I must go with Mr. Ballard. I accordingly went with him, determining to serve him obediently and faithfully. I remained in his service almost three years, and as he lived near the residence of my wife's master, my former mode of life was not materially changed, but this change of home, Chap I mean, page 26. Mrs. Sims spent much of her time in exchanging visits with the families of the other large planters, both in Calvert and in the neighboring this counties, and thought my wife, I became acquainted with the, pri sorry, through my wife, I became acquainted with the private family history of many of the principal persons in Maryland. There was a great proprietor who resided in another country, sorry, county, well, I keep saying country, who owned several hundred slaves and who permitted them to beg of travelers on the highway. I, I have to fight myself for making comments while I'm reading. This same gentleman had several daughters and according to the custom of the time, kept what they called open house. That is, his house was free to all persons of genteel appearance who chose to visit it. The young ladies were supposed to be the greatest fortunes in the country, where reputed beauty and consequently were greatly admired. Two gentlemen who were lovers of these girls, desirous of amusing their mistresses, invited a young man who's standing in the society they supposed to be beneath theirs to go with them to the manor, as it was called. When there, they endeavored to make him an object of ridicule in presence of the ladies. But he so well acquainted himself and manifested such superior wit and talents that one of the young ladies fell in love with him and soon after wrote him a letter which led to their marriage. His two pretended friends were never afterwards countenanced by the family as gentlemen of honor. But the fortunate husband avenged himself on his heartless companions by invent inviting them to his wedding and exposing them to the observation of the vast assemblage of fashionable people who had always attended a marriage in the family of a great planter. The two gentlemen who had been thus made to fall into the pit that they dug for another were so much chagrined at the issue of the adventure that one soon left Maryland and the other became a common drunk and died a few years afterwards. My change of masters realized all the evil apprehensions which I had entertained. I found Mr. Ballard sullen and crabbed in his temper and also prone to find fault with my conduct. No matter how hard I labored or how careful I was to fulfill all his orders and obey his most unreasonable commands, yet it so happened that he never beat me for which I was altogether indebted to the good character for industry, sobriety, and humility which I in, had established in the neighborhood. I think he was ashamed to abuse me, lest he should suffer in the good opinion of the public, for he often fell into the most violent fits of anger against me and overwhelmed me with coarse and abusive language. He did not give me clothes enough to keep me warm in winter, and compel me to work in the woods when there was deep snow on the ground, by which I suffered very much. I had determined at last to speak to him to sell me to some person in the neighborhood so that I might be near my, my wife and children, but a different fate awaited me. My master kept a store at a small village on the bank of the Patoxent River called B, 
although he resided at some distance on a farm. One morning he rose early and ordered me to take a yoke of oxen and go to the village to bring home a cart which was there, saying he would follow me. He arrived at the village sooner after I did and took his breakfast and his storekeeper. He then told me to come into the house and get my breakfast. While I was eating in the kitchen, I observed him talking earnestly, but low to a stranger near the kitchen door. I soon after went out and hitched my ox into the cart and was about to drive off when several men came around about me and amongst them, the stranger who I had seen him speaking with my master. This man came up to me and seized me by the collar, shook me violently, saying I was his property and must go with him to Georgia. At the sound of these words and the thoughts of my wife and children rushed across my mind and my heart beat away within me. I saw and knew that my case was hopeless and that resistance was vain as there were near 20 persons present, all whom were ready to assist the man by whom I was kidnapped. I felt incapable of weeping or speaking, and in my despair, I laughed loudly. My purchaser ordered me to cross my hands behind, which were quickly bound with a strong cord, and then he told me that we must set out that very day for the South. I asked if I could not be allowed to go see my wife and children, or if this could not be permitted, if they might not have leave to come to see me but was told that I would not, I would be able to get another wife in Georgia. My new master, whose name I did not hear, took me that same day across the, I think this is Patuxent, where I joined five, uh, sorry, 51 of the slaves whom he had bought in Maryland. For those who just joined us, we are reading 50 years in change. The thing is getting like, wow, right about now. He has just been kidnapped. We're on page 29. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to, uh, and we're going to discuss at the end of this chapter. This thing is getting wild. 32 of these were men and 19 were women. The women were merely tied together with a rope about the size of a bed cord, which was tied like a halter around the neck of each. But the men of whom I was the stoutest and strongest were very differently compar sorry, comparisoned. A strong iron collar was closely fitted by means of a padlock round each of our necks. A chain of iron about a hundred feet in length was passed through the hasp of each paddock, padlock, except at two ends, where the hasp of the paddock passed through a link of the chain. In addition to this, we were handcuffed in pairs with iron staples and bolts with a, a short chain about a foot long uniting the handcuff and their wearers in pairs. In this manner, we had chained alternate, uh, alternately by the right and the left hand, and the poor man to whom I was thus chained wept like an infant when the blacksmith with his hemi ha heavy hammer fastened the ends of the bolts that kept the staples from slipping from our arms. For my own part, I felt indifferent to my fate. It appeared to me that the worst had come, that could come and to no change of fortune could harm me. After we were all chained and handcuffed together, we sat down upon the ground and here reflecting upon the sad reverse of fortune that had suddenly overtaken me, I became very weary of life and bitterly execrated the day I was born. He sounds like, okay, let me not comment. It, it seemed that I was destined by fate to drink the cup of sorrow to the very dregs and that I should find no respite, no respite from misery, but in the grave. I longed to die and escape from the hands of my tormentors, but even the wretched privilege of destroying myself was denied me, for I could not shake off my chains, nor move a yard without the consent of my master. Reflecting in silence upon my forlorn condition, I at length concluded that as things could not become worse, and as the life of man is but a continued round of changes, they must of necessity take a turn in my favor at some future day. I found relief in this vague and indefinite hope. And when we received orders to go on board the scow, which was transport, which was to transport us over the Patuxent, I marched down to the water with a firmness of purpose of which I did not believe myself capable a few minutes before. 
we were soon on the south side of the river and taking up our line of march we traveled about five miles that evening and stopped for the night at one of those miserable public houses so frequent in the lower parts of maryland and virginia called ordinaries our master ordered a pot of mush to be made for our supper after dispatching which we all lay down on the naked floor to sleep in our handcuffs and chains the women my fellow slaves lay on one side of the room and the men who were chained with me occupied the other i slept but little this night which i passed in thinking of my wife and little children who i could not hope ever to see again i also thought of my grandfather and of the long nights i had passed with him listening to his narratives of the scenes through which he had passed in Africa. I at length fell asleep, but was distressed by painful dreams. My wife and children appeared to be weeping and lamenting my calamity and beseeching and imploring my master on their knees not to carry me away from them. My little boy came and begged me not to go, leave him and endeavored, man, this is gonna make me cry, and endeavored as I thought with his little hands to break the fetters that bound me. I woke up in agony and cursed my existence. I could not pray for the measure of my woes seemed to be full. And I felt as if there was no mercy in heaven nor compassion on earth for a man who was born a slave. Day at length came and with the dawn, we resumed our journey towards the Potomac. As we passed along the road, I saw the slaves at work in the corn and tobacco fields. I knew they toiled hard and lacked food, but they were not like me, dragged in chains from their wives and children and friends. Compared with me, they were the happiest of mortals. I almost envied them. Wow, man, what? I almost envied, <laughs> I almost envied them their blessed lot. Before night, we crossed the Potomac at Holes Ferry and bade, bade farewell to Maryland. At night, we stopped at the house of a poor gentleman at least he appeared to wish my master to consider him a gentleman and he had no difficulty in establishing his claim to poverty he lived at the side of the road in a framed house which he had never been plastered within which he which had never been plastered within the weather boards being the only wall he had about 50 acres of land enclosed by a fence the remain of a farm which had once covered two or three hundred acres, but the cedar bushes had encroached upon all sides until the cultivation had been confined to its present limits. The land was the picture of sterility, and there was neither barn nor stable on the place. The owner was ragged, and his wife and children were in a similar plight. It was with difficulty that he obtained a bushel of corn, which our master ordered us to parch at fireside. Sorry. I just put fire side up in there, huh? Ordered us to parch at fire made in the yard and to eat for our supper. Even his miserable family possessed two slaves, half starved, half naked wretches, whose appearance bestowed them fam familiar with hunger and victims of the lash. But yet there was one pang which they had not known. They had not been chained and driven from their parents or children into hopeless exile. We are on page 33 um of 50 years and change for those who have just joined us it says if you have missed it this is on replay after we're done so you can definitely go back and catch up we'll be picking up on sunday most high willing um on chapter three it says we left this place early in the morning and directed our course towards the southwest our master riding beside us and hastening our march sometimes by words of encouragement sometimes by threats of punishment the women took their place in the rear of our line. We halted about nine o'clock for breakfast and received as much cornbread as we could eat, together with a plate of boiled herring and about three pounds of pork amongst us. Before we left this place, I was removed from near the middle of the chain and placed at the, end, the front end of it so that I now became the leader of the file and held this post of honor until our irons were taken from us near the town of Columbus in South Carolina. We continued our route this day along the high road between the Potomac and, a, oh, here we go, Rafa, Rafa, no, not, Rafa, Rafanuk, Rafanuk, 
and I saw each of those rivers several times before night. Our master gave us no dinner today, but we halted and got as much corn mush and sour milk as we could eat for supper. The weather grew mild and pleasant, and we needed no more fires at night. From this time, we all slept promiscuously, men and women on the doors of such houses as we chanced to stop at. We passed on through Bowling Green, a quiet village. Time did not reconcile me to my chains, but it made me familiar with them. I reflected on my desperate situation with a degree of calmness, hoping that I might be able to devise some means of escape. My master placed a particular value upon me, for I heard him tell a tavern keeper that if he had me in Georgia, he could get $800 for me. But he had bought me for his brother and believed that he should not sell me. He afterwards changed his mind, however. I carefully examined every part of our chain, but found no place where it could be separated. We all had as much cornbread as we could eat, procured of our owner at places we stopped at for the night. In addition to this, we usually had a salt heron every day. On Sunday, we had a quarter pound of bacon each. We continued our course up the country westward for a few days and then turned south, crossed James River above, above Richmond, as I heard at the time. After more than four weeks of travel, my goodness, we entered South Carolina near Camden, and for the first time, I saw a field of cotton in bloom. As we approached the Yadkin River, the tobacco disappeared from fields and the cotton plant took its place as the article of general culture. I was now a slave in South Carolina and had no hope of ever seeing my wife and children. I had time serious thoughts of suicide, so great was my anguish. If I could have got a rope, I would have hanged myself at Lancaster. The thought of my wife and children I had been torn from in Maryland and the dreadful undefined future which was before me came near driving me mad i was long after midnight before it was long after midnight before i fell asleep both the most pleasant dreams succeeded to those scornful forebodings forebodings i thought i had escaped my master and through great difficulties made my way back to maryland and was again in my wife's cabin with my little children on my lap Every object was so vividly impressed on my mind in this dream that when I woke, a firm conviction settled upon my mind that by some means at present sorry, that by some means at present incomprehensible to me, I should yet again embrace my wife and caress my children in their humble dwelling. Early in the morning, our master called us up and distributed to each of the party a cake made from cornmeal and a small piece of bacon. Boy, they love giving them some pork. <laughs> to page 36, I'm sorry, I couldn't help that one. But um, on our journey, we had only eaten twice a day and had not received breakfast until about nine o'clock. But he said this morning meal was given to welcome us to South Carolina. Seriously? He then addressed us all and told us we might not give up all hope of ever returning to the places of our net i can't i gotta read that one again he then addressed us all and told us we might not give up all hope of ever returning to the places of our nativity as it would be impossible for us to pass through the states of north carolina and virginia without being taken up and sent back he further advised us to make ourselves contented as he would take us to georgia a far better country than any we had seen and where we would be able to live in the greatest abundance. Serious? About sunrise, we took up our march on the road to Columbia, as we were told. Hitherto, our master had not offended, sorry, offered to sell any of us, and had even refused to stop to talk to anyone on the subject of our sale, although he had several times been addressed on this point before we reached Lancaster. But soon after we departed from this village, we were overtaken on the road by a man on horseback who accosted our driver by asking him if his niggas were for sale. The latter replied that he believed he would not sell any yet as he was on his way to Georgia and cotton being now much in demand, he expected to obtain high prices for us, for persons who were going to settle in the new purchase. 
He, however, contrary to his custom, ordered us to stop and told the stranger he might look at us and that he would find us as fine a lot of hands as were ever imported into the country. <laughs> that we were all prime property and he had no doubt would command his own prices in Georgia. The stranger who was a thin, weather-beaten, sunburnt figure then said he wanted a couple of breeding wrenches <clears throat> and would give as much for them as they would bring in Georgia, that he had lately heard from Augusta and the niggers were not higher than in Columbia. And as he had been in Columbia the week before, he knew that he knew what niggers were worth. He then walked along our line as we stood chained together and looked at the whole of us, then turning to the women, asked the prices of the two pregnant ones. Our master replied that these were two of the best breeding winches in all of Maryland. That one was 22 and the other only 19. That the first was already the mother of seven children and that the other of four. That he had himself seen the children at the time he bought their mothers. And that such winches would be cheap at a thousand dollars each but as they were not able to keep up with the gang, uh, they were pregnant. He would take, sorry, that, that was me. That's not the book. He would take $1,200 for the two. The purchaser said this was too much, but he would give $900 for the pair. The price was promptly refused, but our master, after some consideration, said he was willing to sell a bargain in these wenches and would take $1,100 for them, which was objected to on the other side, and many faults and failings were pointed out in the merchandise. After much bargaining and many gross jests on the part of the stranger, he offered $1,000 for the two and said he would give no more. He then mounted his horse and moved off, but after he had gone about 100 yards, he was called back. And our master said if he would go with him to the next blacksmith shop on the road to Columbia and play for taking the irons of, off the rest of us, he might have the two women. This proposal was agreed to. And as it was now about nine o'clock, we were ordered to hasten on to the next house where we were told we must stop for breakfast. At this place, we were informed that it was 10 miles to the next smith shop and our new acquaintance was obliged by the terms of his contract to accompany us thither. He received for breakfast about a pint of boiled rice to each person, sorry, we. And after this was dispatched, we again took to the road, each to reach the blacksmith shop, at which he, we expected to be relieved of the iron rings and chains, which had so long galled and worried us. About two o'clock, we arrived at the long for residence of the smith, but on inquiry, our master was informed that he was not at home and we and would not return before evening. Here's a contra here a controversy arose whether we should all remain here until the Smith returned or the stranger should go on with us to the next smithery, which was said to be only five miles distance. This was this was a point not easily settled between the two such spirits as our master and the stranger, both of whom had been overseers in their time and both of whom had risen to the rank of proprietors of slaves. The matter had already pronounced angry words and much vaunting on the part of the stranger that a free man of South Carolina was not to be imposed upon and that by constitution of the state, his rights were sacred and he was not to be deprived of his liberty at the arbitrary will of man just, <laughs> sorry people, <laughs> sorry at the arbitrary will of, of man just for amongst the Yankees, just from amongst the Yankees, and who had brought with him to the South as many Yankee tricks as he had niggers, and he believed many more. He then swore that all the niggers in the drove were Yankee niggers. When I overseed for the Kona Polk, said he, on his rice plantation, he had two Yankee niggers that he brought from Maryland and they were running away every day. I gave them a hundred lashes more than a dozen times, 
but they never quit running away till I chained them together with iron collars round their necks and chained them to spades and made them do nothing but ditch, dig ditches to drain the rice swamps. They would not run away then unless they went together and carried their chains and spades with them. I kept them this way two years and better niggas I never had. One of them died one night and the other was never good for anything after he lost his mate. He never ran away afterwards, but he died too after a while. He then addressed himself to the two women whose master he had become and told them that if they ever ran away, he would treat them in the same way. Wretched as I was myself, my heart bled for those poor creatures who had fallen into the hands of a tiger in human form. The dispute between the two masters was still raging when unexpectedly the blacksmith rode up to his house on a thin, bony looking horse and two, oh, and dismounted, asking his wife what these gentlemen were making such a frolic about. I did not hear her answer, but both the disputants turned and addressed themselves to the smith the one to know what price he would demand to take the irons off of all these niggas, and the other to know how long it would take him to perform the work. It is here proper for me to observe that there are many phrases of language in common use in Carolina and Georgia, which are applied in a way that would not be understood by persons of from one of the Northern states. For instance, when several persons are quarreling, brawling, and making a great noise, even fighting, they say, the gentlemen are frolicking. I heard many other terms equally strange while I was re residing in Southern country, among such white people as I became acquainted with, though my acquaintance was confined in a great measure to overseers and such people as did not associate with the rich planters and great families. For those who have just joined us, this is the Lev Project. We are currently reading 50 Years in Chains. This is like, uh, while we are going to the end of the, let me see here. Yeah, we're almost at the end of the second chapter. Right now, I am on, what did I, I just left my page here. I, I believe I was on chapter 41. I mean, page 41. So I'll pick up. The Smith at length agreed to take the irons from the whole of us for $2.50 and immediately set about it with the air of indifference that he would have manifested in tearing a pair of old shoes from the hooves of a wagon horse. It was four weeks and five days from the time my irons had been riveted upon me, riveted them on them until they were removed. And great as had been my sufferings while chained to my fellow slaves, I cannot say that I felt any pleasure in being released from my long confinement. For I knew that my liberation was only preparatory to my final and as I feared perpetual subjugation to the power of su some such monster as the one then before me, who was preparing to drive away the two unfortunate women who had purchased and whose lifeblood he had acquired the power of shedding at pleasure for the sum of a thousand dollars. After we were released from our chains, our master sold the whole lot of irons which we had borne from Maryland to the blacksmith for $7. The smith then procured a bottle of rum and treated his two new acquaintances to a part of its contents, wishing them both good luck with their niggers. And these civilities were over. After these civilities were over, the two women were ordered to follow their new master who shaped his course across the country by a road leading westward. At parting from us, they both wept aloud and wrung their hands in despair. We all went to them and bade them a last farewell. Their road led into a wood and they soon entered and I never saw them nor heard of them again. These women had both been driven from Calvert County as well as myself and the fate of the younger of the two was peculiarly severe. She had been brought up as a waiting maid of a young lady the daughter of a gentleman whose wife and family often visited the mischief of my own wife. I had frequently seen this woman when she was a young girl in attendance upon her young mistress and riding in the same carriage with her. The father of the young lady died and soon after she married a gentleman who resided a few miles off. 
the husband received considerable fortune with his bride, and amongst other things, her mating weight, who was reputed a great beauty among people of color. He had been addicted to fashionable sports of the country before marriage, such as horse racing, fox hunting, etc. And I had heard the black people say that he drank too freely, but it was supposed that he would correct all these irre irregularities after marriage, more especially after his wife was a great belle and withal very handsome. The reverse, however, turned out to be the fact. Instead of growing better, he became worse. And the course of a few years was known all over the country as a drunkard and a gambler. His wife, it was said, died of grief. And soon after her death, his effects were seized by his creditors and sold by the sheriff. The former weight made thing made, now the mother of several children, was purchased by our present master for $400 at the sheriff's sale. And this poor wretch, whose employment is earlier life had been to take care of a young mistress and attend to her in her chamber and at her toilet, and after being torn from her husband and her children, had now gone to the toil out a horrible existence beneath the, scorch, the scorching sun of South Carolina cotton field under the dominion of a master as void of the manners of a gentleman as he was of language of humanity. It was now late in the afternoon, but as we had made little progress today and were now divested of the bur burden of our chains, as well as freed from the two women who had hereto, hitherto much retarded our march, our master ordered us to hasten our way as we had 10 miles to go to the evening, page 44. I had been so long oppressed by the weight of my chains and the iron collar about my neck that for some time after I commenced walking at my natural liberty, I felt a kind of giddiness or lightheadedness of the head. Most of my companions complained of the same sensation and we did not recover our proper feelings so after we had spent one night. It was after dark when we arrived at our lodging place which proved to be the house of a small cotton planter, who it appeared kept a sort of house of entertainment for travelers, contrary to what I afterwards discovered to be the usual custom of cotton planters. This man and my master had known each other before and seemed to be well acquainted. He was the first person that we met had met since leaving Maryland, who was known to my master. And as they kept up a very free conversation, though the course of the, through the course of the evening, and the house in which they were was only separated from the kitchen in which we were lodged by a space of a few feet. I had an opportunity of hearing much that was highly interesting to me. The landlord after supper came with our master to look at us and to see us receive our allowance of boiled rice from the hands of a couple of black women who prepared it in the large iron kettle. Whilst reviewing us, the former asked the latter what he intended to do with his drove but no reply was made to this inquiry. Page 45. And as our master had through our whole journey maintained a steady silence on this subject, I felt a great curiosity to know what disposition he intended to make of the whole gang and myself in particular. On their return to the house, I advanced to a small window in the kitchen, which brought me within a few yards of the place where they sat and from which I was able to hear all they said. Although they spoke in low tone of voice, I heard, sorry, I here learned that so many of us as could be sold for a good price were to be disposed of in Columbia on our arrival at that place and that the residue would be driven to Augusta and sold there. The landlord assured my master that at this time, slaves were in much demand, both in Columbia and Augusta that purchasers were, purchasers were numerous and prices good, and that the best plan of effecting good sales would be to put up each nigger separately at auction after giving a few days notice by an advertisement in the neighboring country. Cotton, he said, had not been higher for many years, and a great many persons, especially young men, were moving off to the new purchase in Georgia. Prime lands were in high demand for the purpose of clearing the land in the new county that the boys and girls under 20 would bring almost any price at present in Colombia for the purpose of picking the growing crop of cotton, 46, which promised to be very heavy. And as most persons had planted more than their hand would be able to pick, young niggas 
who would soon learn to pick cotton were prime articles in the market. As to those who more advanced, sorry, more advanced in life, he seemed to think the prospect of selling them at, at an unusual price not so good, as they could not so readily become expert cotton pickers. He said further that for some cause which he would could not comprehend, the price of rice had not been so good this year as usual, and that he had found it cheaper to purchase rice to feed his own niggas than to provide them with corn, which had been brought from the upper country. He therefore advised my master not to drive us toward the rice plantation on the low country. My master said he would follow his advice, at least so far as to sell a portion of us in Carolina, but seemed to be of the opinion that his prime hands would bring him more money in Georgia, and named me in particular as one who would be worth at least $1,000 to a man who was about making a settlement and clearing plantation in new purchase. I therefore concluded that in the course of events, I was likely to become property of a Georgian, which turned out in the end to be the case. Though not so soon as I at the time apprehended, I sat but little this night, feeling as restlessness when no longer in chains and pondering over my future lot of my life, which appeared fraught only with evil and misfortune. Day at length dawn, with its first light, we were ordered to be, betake ourselves to the road, which we were told would lead us to Carol Columbia, the place of intended sale of some, if not all of us. For several days, I had observed that in the country through which we traveled, little attention was paid to the cultivation of anything but cotton. Now this plant was almost the sole possessor of the fields. It covered the plantations adjacent to the road as far as I could see, both before and behind me, and looked not unlike buckwheat before it blossoms. I saw some small fields of corn and lots of sweet potato. Amongst the young vines of watermelons were frequently visible. The improvements on the plantations were not good. There were no barns, but only stables and sheds to put the cotton under, as it was brought from the field. Hay seemed to be unknown in the country, for I saw neither haystacks nor meadows, and the few fields that were lying fallow had but small numbers of cattle in them, and these were thin and meager. We had met with no flocks of sheep of late, and the hogs that we saw on the roadside were in bad condition. The horses and mules that I saw in the cotton fields were poor and badly harnessed and half naked condition of the Negroes who drove them or followed with the whole, together with their wan complexions, wan complexions, proved to me that they had too much work or not enough food. This is the last page of this chapter two. We passed a cotton gin this morning, the first that I ever saw, but they were not at work with it. We almost met a party of ladies and gentlemen on a country, sorry, on a journey of pleasure, riding in two handsome carriages drawn by sleek and spirited horses, very different in appearance from the moving skeletons that I had noticed, noticed drawing the plows in the field. The black drivers of the coaches were neatly clad in gay colored clothes and contrasted well with their half naked brethren, a gang of whom were hoeing cotton by the roadside near them, attended by an overseer in a white linen shirt and pantaloons with one of the long Negro whips in his hand. I observed that these poor people did not raise their heads to look at either the fine coaches and horses then passing or at us, but kept their faces steadily bent towards the cotton plants from among which they were removing weeds. I, al I almost shuddered at the sight, knowing that I myself was doomed to a state of servitude equally cruel and debasing unless by some unformed, sorry, unless by some unforeseen occurrence I might fall into the hands of a master of less inhumanity of temper than the one who had possession of the miserable creatures before me. That was the end of chapter two. Going forward, we're gonna read, um, depends on the volunteers, but we're gonna read at least one uh, chapter a day, depending on our volunteers. Um, the floor is now open. That was a long chapter but it's like a soap opera at this point <laughs> to really uh, find out what is happening in his life at this point. Um, once he is on his way, he told us about his travel four weeks and five days. 
on foot and in chains from Maryland to, at this point, South Carolina. Um, yeah. I think I um, read about this was like the second mass exodus, they called it, when cotton began to take up in the South, um, deeper South, and they were really taking people, as he described, um, and, and kidnapping people and selling them deep, deep South. And, uh, and this is, I have to look up the time period for next time, but this seems to be that time period where cotton is, is, is springing up and they're, and he's one of those who's experiencing this. If anybody has anything to say, who, if you're on the line or if you're on the computer, feel free to um, speak at this point. The mic is open. Is anyone there? I know you guys are there. It's 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 some heavy material, you know. Um, you know, we spend so much time. There's so much that I, I find that there's a wealth of information, a wealth of history, and and this is what this project was really about. Even though the information is heavy, and even though it's difficult to go through, it's something that is helpful, you know, as we go through this healing process. I hear somebody on the line. Would you like to comment? Treatment can be disinformation, can be very just sobering, can be hard to digest, you know, and it's the father. Yeah. It's the father. Yeah, it's, um, I think when we look today, it's like we forgot, you know, um, For sure. we forgot. And I, and, and I think it's a crime that we forgot because it's, it, the, the key is in remembering how far and what exactly, instead of just saying slavery, okay, what did that look like? Everybody had different experiences, you know, um, and some were when, they, when, when they were emancipated, they put it on record. So the least we can do is to give voice to those who came before us and those who even today are in a different level of slavery, who are in the prison houses, who are in um, indentured uh, situations that if they could, they if they wanted to, they can't move, you know, understand? And so instead of just waiting for, you know, 28 days in February, I thought it appropriate today, as we read a little bit, he said it here, but in the next book that we're gonna read um, after this one, uh, incidents in the life of a slave girl. This is another one by. Uh, uh, we're going to read it from a. Ma we're reading from a masculine perspective, and I think it's interesting to read from both perspectives. The experience of slavery, because as I'm studying now, that experience is definitely different. So right now, you know, he he he's telling the story from the outside as a male about the two women that who were pregnant, and that's the wild part that you know, and mothers and were sold off. And the man is is um, saying how, you know, yeah, they had to prove they were fertile. So yeah, I know she's a good breeding wench, you know, cause you know, I just ripped her away from seven children. And to me, it's like, what level did your mind really have to go to, to really think that was a selling point? Um, and the breeding of slaves is another thing, but definitely we're reading at this point. So I say that to say, and, and he, he, he seems very empathetic that even though others are experiencing um, pain and experiencing this trauma, that he, in his mind, were, were looking as he did towards his mother in that way to say, wow, he really feels sorry for them. And at the same point, can't do anything for them. And that's really disempowering as a man, um, as we're going to continue to read and look at. And why is this important? It's because today, we still suffer with the trauma that was inflicted at this point. Today, psychologically, we still go forward. Why can't we work together? Why this, why that? A lot of the answers are in understanding what actually happened and what parts of our relationship were severely damaged. Um, does anyone have anything to say at this time? Um, I wanted to say that for me, it's not necessarily that I forget it's more that I don't know how to deal with the, I don't know how to deal with it. Of uh, not being angry, um, just putting things in perspective on a day to day because we all go through signs of our past 
on a daily basis. Yes. And, and that's a good point. A lot of us don't know how to deal with it, and so we just don't. You know what I'm saying? We 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 like this is too much because um like you said I met a woman uh this year and she said I was talking to her she said you know I've never watched Roots she said I tell other people to watch Roots I said why don't, why have you never watched it she said because I can't handle it and that that shows us that it still hurts it's like if you you scraped yourself or you got a burn or something or you had some kind of injury and then some your parent when you were young come and touch it and you go don't touch it don't look at it you didn't even want them to look at it. You're like, please don't touch it, don't look at it, it still hurts. And this is kind of our reaction, a lot of people, a lot of us, we can't, we don't know how to deal with it. But the reality is um, the benefits of us processing it the way we're doing, I think it's, it's very beneficial that we, we read and experience it because the reality is our foreparents had to experience this um, and they had to go through it. And because we are wherever we're coming from my parents from the caribbean some people from california some people from carolina some people from georgia that experience still lives on today and not dealing with it you know is not really um progressive and i understand we don't know how so together possibly we can begin to learn to at least acknowledge and be able to take a look and, um, and take the veil off of it so that it's not so mysterious anymore and really process some of these emotions and feelings. For instance, if this was you, how would you feel? You understand what I'm saying? Because then we're going to be able to look and put together, okay, he was, his, he was ripped away from his mother. What did that create in the mind? His father ran away, even though he knew that he had to, that you know there's things like abandonment issues there's things like the ability to connect there's things these are the things how psychologically one is affected by these traumas and so when we take a look at these traumas we can use it now to look at our life and then our own personal family history and say okay my family deals with things this way and begin to understand i wonder why and why did i adopt this way and is it healthy is it not healthy okay what can i begin to do to make it healthy so it's all encompassing if we allow it to be um, by just processing it a little at a time and seeing, like I said, what kind of individual would this create? A withdrawn individual, um, one who doesn't trust, um, you know, so many different things. But um, that's kind of just the overview. So thank you so much for that, sis. Does anyone else have anything to say at this time? So like I said, uh, possibly, not possibly, Sunday most I willing at 12 o'clock, we're going to pick up on, oh man, what did I do? We're gonna pick up on chapter three and um, just meditate on it. That's why I didn't wanna read too many chapters all at once because it is some heavy stuff, you know, and it is some heavy stuff. Um, and that's why today I just kicked it off with two, but I think I'm, I'm gonna go back down to one because of the nature and the, um, the weight of it. it. It needs kind of like, it's like you have a full meal, you kind of need to process it, you know? Um, so we're gonna kick it back down to one so we can really just have these discussions and not be over overwhelmed. So again, um, just take the time to heal. If right now you're feeling full with emotions and not knowing where, pin them down, write them down um, and try to identify what part of the story really hit you or what part of the story like I said, for me, the whole story is hitting me, um, the inhumanity towards the parents. And although we know this was left on record, like I told somebody, just because we know that something doesn't ha is going to happen, that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt anymore. You know, just because you tell somebody, hey, I'm going to do this, and, it, and it's something that's supposed to hurt you, it doesn't mean that it doesn't hurt you. It just means that you knew that you was going to get it. And that's kind of like this experience. So um, until next time, if at this time no one has anything else to say, I want to thank you for joining us. This is, oh, I just want to say one more thing. On January 1st, although we don't subscribe to this new year, like he said in the book, as well as Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, this is when you would be hired out. This is when, if you were in the Americas in the South, your four parents would have been taken to, like he said, an auction place or rented out or hired out it wasn't a celebratory celebratory it was not a celebratory time for the slaves 
because this is when they were going to be separated from their family in some capacity. So it's always good to know, um, and this has been all about it. It's always good to know some historical background to kind of understand where other people are celebrating. They, they, they cause us to easily forget where we're coming from and what this is all really about. So be not distracted. Um, don't follow the masses, you know, get understanding of where we are. Um, and that the same, we are the children of ex slaves and some of the people who are walking around are children of ex masters. Yeah. And some maintain the same mentality and thought process. And we have to keep that in mind, not for harboring hatred and resentment and anger, but for understanding the dynamic in which we operate today. So until next time, my name is Amuna Yisrael. I hope to see you for the next edition of Lift Every Voice. Again, if you would like to volunteer to read, I know we have more readers coming. So if you volunteer to read, just drop me an inbox or, or if you know me, give me a call and we'll put you on the list for reading. So thank you once again and everyone have a good day.